Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is John Ravenhill. It's my privilege to be the director of the Balsili School of International Affairs, and great pleasure to welcome everyone this evening. Um, this is a very special event. Um, the school is very much the junior partner in this event this evening. Um, we are partnering with Laurier, um, especially with Laurier's International Migration Research Center, um, but also with the Canadian International Council. And why this is very special is that the Council has just relaunched in Waterloo, and this, I believe, is the second of their events. And our speaker this evening is going to tell you a bit more about the Council and its plans for the Waterloo region. So that's all I'm going to say this evening, just a very warm welcome. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alison Mounts, who is the director of Laurier's International Migration Research Centre. Hello, good evening, welcome, and thank you all so much for being here. As John said, I'm Alison Mounts. I direct the International Migration Research Center, or IMRC, which is right upstairs here in the Balsili School. Uh, we're a community of researchers, uh, faculty, students, uh, working here in the local community and also abroad on issues related to immigration, displacement, workers, refugee health, um, citizenship. Uh, so I want to welcome you on behalf of our center and also Loria University, where I'm on faculty. I also want to acknowledge that we're gathered tonight on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. There are, of course, long histories of migration and displacement and struggles over belonging here um, in this region that are, of course, important to remember when we discuss contemporary migrations and displacements and all of the territorial politics surrounding them. I want to thank those who funded tonight's event uh, and who organized it, including our provost and vice president academic, that's Rob Gordon, uh, the Canadian International Council, which we'll hear more about shortly, uh, including the Waterloo branch and its president, uh, Laszlo Sarkany. I'm also grateful to Laurier International and the staff here at the Balsili School, and of course, the coordinator of our center, Sean Lockwood, for all of the work that they put into organizing for tonight. It's really difficult to imagine a more important topic of conversation than the one we've gathered tonight to discuss. Globally, of course, we're experiencing the displacement of a historically high number of people um, since the aftermath of World War II when the global community designed the architecture to govern immigration and displacement. And at the precise moment that we're experiencing and witnessing this high number of people displaced, we're also experiencing, of course, a rise around the globe in xenophobia and racism and anti-immigrant sentiments and actions and politics. So these aren't just kind of fringe uh, movements, but things that are making their way into very mainstream um, government policies and political parties. They're affecting those who are displaced, of course, and, and marginalized, but also mainstream political parties and the institutions that are designed to govern. So these are issues that affect all of us, and it's important that we come together to find out more information and analysis and enter into dialogue about them. And we're very fortunate to have Ben Rosewell here with us tonight to talk about the issues. Our format is that Ben is going to talk to you, um, and then we will sit down for a brief conversation and then open the floor, and you'll see there are microphones uh, at the front of the room, and we join you to, to ask questions, provide comments, and enter into dialogue. So it's my um, honor to introduce you now to our speaker, Ben Rosewell. Uh, ben was appointed President and Research Director of the Canadian International Council in November of last year. He has 25 years of experience as a practitioner of international relations. He earned his expertise in international security with the UN in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993 as Canada's first diplomatic envoy, to, part of the first diplomatic envoy to Baghdad, Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein and as the head of NATO provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar at the height of Canada's involvement in Afghanistan. Ben has advised top levels of government on international strategy in the Privy Council office during the tenures of Prime Ministers Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper, 
and at the Washington DC Center for Strategic and International Studies from 2003 to 2004. But his abiding passion is the defense of human rights and democracy. He established the Democracy Unit of Global Affairs Canada, worked closely with human rights movements as a political officer in the Canadian Embassy to Egypt, and most recently as Canada's ambassador to Venezuela from 2014 to 2017. Throughout his career, Ben has sought to engage citizens in the practice of international relations after a fellowship at Stanford University that introduced him to the powerful role that individuals can play in global affairs, he pioneered the practice of digital diplomacy at Global Affairs Canada. This same passion led him to join Farhan Ladani in founding software startup called Better Place, which creates opportunities for citizens to engage in civic action through a mobile app. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ben Rosewell. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for that warm welcome. Uh, I think it's really extraordinary to see so many centers of expertise on international relations here in Waterloo. This is really an emerging center, I think, for, uh, for the Canadian um, discussion on our role in the world. And so it's a real honor to partner with uh, the Balsillie School of International Affairs and the International Migration Research Center within it. And uh, a big thanks to Rob Gordon, the provost and vice president of academic who was uh, the original inspiration behind uh, tonight's event. Uh, yes, we are relaunching the Waterloo chapter of the Canadian International Council under the leadership of, uh, of Laszlo, and we'll be talking shortly uh, towards the end of some future events. But I wanted to start this discussion by explaining the history of the CIC, uh, what it is we do, and uh, why you should all become members. The CIA's... Um, CIC's predecessor was called the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, and it had its origins in an event that happened 100 years ago. That was the Paris peace talks that put an end to the First World War. That was the very first time that Canada exercised an independent role in international diplomacy. Back in 1919, we didn't control our own foreign policy that was still run out of London, but we had earned the right through the soldiers uh, that had died, Canadian soldiers that had died in First World War, uh, under Prime Minister Robert Borden, we insisted on having our own independent presence at that peace talks. Well, the delegates that were gathered in Paris for that year, from January 1919 to January 2020, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, uh, came to be increasingly concerned over the course of that year at the scale and uh, severity of the international challenges the world was still facing even after the war had ended, on the one hand, and the isolation, the distance that most Canadians felt from those trends. Those obviously had drawn us into a very bloody conflict in 1914, and many Canadians lived under the hope that we wouldn't um, be bothered to that extent, that we wouldn't be drawn into the world's conflicts again. But the Versailles delegates sensed that that was not likely to be the case. And so when they returned to Canada, they established the CIIA in five cities across the, uh, the country. The goal was not necessarily to shape decision-making in Ottawa, but rather to engage the Canadian public on issues facing the world and to increase our level as citizens, our level of knowledge and information, and our ability uh, to parse what's happening in the international system. Now we have 15 branches from coast to coast in seven different provinces and 1,500 uh, close to 1,500 members. Uh, in those early years, the 1920s and the 1930s, some of the principal issues being discussed by CIIA chapters across the country was the rise of two disturbing new ideologies that presented alternatives to liberal democracy that were gaining currency in some of the most important countries in the world with frightening consequences for international relations and which potentially well, had the potential to gain some currency in Canada as well, because fascism and communism had uh, deep roots in countries that were not that dissimilar to Canada. Uh, to honor that tradition, 100 years later, I would like to use this opportunity uh, to share my concerns about another ideology that has taken root in many countries around the world that are similar to Canada, and which has the potential to also take root in Canada if we're not careful. That um, phenomenon, uh, we could debate what the term 
could be. Uh, populism is the term that I will use. I know that it's a contested concept, and there's many different ways of understanding populism. But I come not so much as a scholar, as uh, an observer in my international experience, having seen a system by which aspirants to political power compete for that power, the relationship that they attempt to establish with individuals of the country, and the way that they exercise power once they gain it. I believe that there's a coherent system, a coherent set of techniques uh, that can be observed in countries uh, of very different geographic locations and very different um, policy prescriptions. So there's a populism of the left, a populism of the right, and many other forms of populism that all follow a very similar logic. And that's why I would argue that uh, we should consider them uh, a, single, um, a single ideological phenomenon. I will also go on to argue that in spite of the impression that populism might be consistent and perhaps even helpful to democracy, since it refers to the people and democracy is about giving power to the people, that in practice, and it's always practice that matters more than theory, populism is inherently anti-democratic. That in the populist systems, certainly the one that I observed in Venezuela, and in the trends that we're seeing in other countries that have adopted populist rule, the outcomes tend to reduce the power that individuals have over the politics of their country and their ability to influence who has power and how it's exercised. And to that end, I'm going to argue that populism is inherently anti-democratic. Let me turn to Venezuela, which is the case where I've had um, the, most, the deepest experience. Venezuela is uh, an interesting country for Canadian citizens um, to think about because while it's in a very different place from where Canada is right now, and thank God for, for from our perspective that uh, we live in such a different situation that what most, most Venezuelans have to put up with now, the countries are actually quite similar in many ways. They're both established uh, in the 19th century. They're about the same size population, about 35 million in both countries. They're both countries uh, that have been marked by high levels of uh, immigration, probably more so uh, focused on Europe in the case of Venezuela. Um, there's less of a diversity of, uh, of sources of immigration uh, to Canada, but it's a, a country that's very much built on immigration. And of course, uh, with a lot of that immigration displacing a native population, which also coincidentally is almost exactly the same size as our native population, about 3% of, uh, uh, of the whole. Throughout most of the 20th century, Venezuela was also a model of political stability and economic prosperity. The most prosperous country in all of Latin America and the most uh, democratic uh, nation of South America, certainly since the 1958 uh, revolution that put an end to military dictatorship and ushered in a democratic uh, era in Venezuela that was the envy of the rest of Latin America. Venezuela more or less overthrew the military yoke under which all Latin American countries labored through most of the 20th century, a full generation before any, uh, any other Latin American country, and as a result was the lodestar for, uh, for democracy and human rights in all of Latin America. Whenever there was a military dictatorship that would crush a human rights movement in other countries and those activists would flee into exile, they would invariably travel to Caracas. Uh, and the memory of Venezuela hosting so many human rights and democracy activists over the years is very much alive and well in other Latin American capitals where some of those former activists have gone on to become presidents and uh, foreign ministers. One of the reasons why you're seeing such a surprising degree of support uh, for the democracy movement in Venezuela from across Latin America, with some notable exceptions, but the vast majority of, of Latin Americans um, have uh, spoken out in, uh, in, in favor of the, uh, the democracy movement in Venezuela as a result. There's a, um, a nostalgia for a time when Venezuela was a leader in democracy and human rights. It was also a fabulously wealthy country, uh, but that is due to both a blessing and a curse that Venezuela has lived under since the 1920s when oil was discovered under its soil. It is the country with the largest proven oil reserves in the world, larger even than Saudi Arabia. Also, another similarity with Canada, the dominant form of, uh, of uh, uh, bitumen in Venezuela 
is a very heavy crude, very similar to the kind that we have in our uh, tar sands. And so there's been a lot that, a lot that our countries have, uh, have had in common over the years, and we traditionally have had an extremely strong bilateral relationship. Our embassy in Caracas was the largest embassy in all of Latin America for most of the 20th century because of the, the scale of our trade and investment relationships as well as our political similarities. The big difference, I would say, in economic terms, is that where Canada relies on the sale of oil and gas for 3% of our national income, in the late, 19th uh, late 20th century, Venezuela relied on it for 75% of their income. And that made them extraordinarily vulnerable to the vagaries of the uh, international oil market. In 1973, when the oil the price of oil shot through the roof. Venezuela went from being quite a stable, uh, prosperous country to being one that was fabulously wealthy and that almost didn't know what to do with all of its oil riches. Under the uh, progressive, left-of-center leadership at the time of a president called Carlos Andres Perez, there were very grand schemes laid uh, to uh, educate the population to send the cream of the crop of Venezuelan uh, high school students abroad to study in international elite universities in the United States and the United Kingdom and elsewhere. There was uh, attempts to launch very ambitious social programs to, uh, to return some of the, uh, the oil wealth um, to, the, uh, to the poorer parts of the population. And there were attempts to reduce the, the reliance on oil, for example, by creating a massive hydroelectric project, the largest in South America, uh, in the southeast, in the jungle of the southeast of the country. Unfortunately, that oil boom was short-lived from a Venezuelan perspective because in 1982, the pendulum swung very dramatically in the opposite direction. The, we had a recession in Canada in the early 80s. It was nothing compared to what the Venezuelans had to endure when the average price of oil went from $79 a barrel to $9 a barrel. It was an economic shock uh, along the lines that it had, uh, it had never seen before in its history. And it created... Uh, First the boom and then the bust created tremendous social problems. The boom created a mass urbanization where all of a sudden it didn't make economic sense to be a farmer or to be uh, running small businesses in the countryside or in the smaller towns of Venezuela. And there was this massive rush to the capital with Venezuela booming um, to the size that it now enjoys at 6 million. It's about the size of Toronto. But to house that many people in such a short amount of time overwhelmed the infrastructure of, uh, of Venezuela. And so the vast majority of that population lived in shanty towns on the, in the hills around, uh, around Caracas. They created a new class of Venezuelans, uh, the urban poor, which hadn't existed in significant numbers up until the 1970s. And of course, as in any economic crisis, it's the poor that suffers the most, and that population suffered tremendously in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, this was also a time of some significant economic orthodoxy across the world. This was the years of the Washington Consensus, and so some of the policies adopted by the Venezuelan governments in the 1980s uh, placed an inordinate faith in the power of the market to solve certain deep-rooted social and economic uh, imbalances. Mistakes uh, were rife in this period, and in 1989, they prompted uh, an, an extremely violent event, which was called the Caracaso. Uh, this was prompted shortly after a left-of-center government was elected, and shortly after the incoming president uh, came, uh, was briefed by the scale of the economic challenges was facing, very suddenly adopted quite a strict um, policy of, uh, of macroeconomic stabilization, as proposed by the IMF and the World Bank. And one of the measures that he introduced was to triple the cost of uh, gasoline. Gasoline had been more or less free for the population under the logic that we're the largest oil producing company in the world, and therefore oil should belong to the, the people. The oil industry had been nationalized many, many years before. So when the price of oil tripled, it created riots in some of the distant commuter bus lines um, servicing this extended population outside Caracas. All hell literally broke loose. It took 
somewhere between 10 days and two weeks for order to be established in Caracas. And in that time, a minimum of 300 people were killed. Some claim there was as much as 2,000 people. Essentially, law and order completely collapsed. That left quite a scar in the psyche of Venezuela. And while liberal democracy continued for 10 years after that, with an alternation of governments each introducing policies to try and address some of these deep-seated economic and social calamities, there was something broken in the political mindset of Venezuelans. This was a society under, under tremendous stress. And as succeeding political parties being elected through free and fair elections proved uh, unable to come up with a set of policies that would, uh, that would restore some stability to the economy, there was uh, increasing dissatisfaction with the existing political system. Uh, not unlike today, the effects of this unequal growth and the uh, instability that, um, that the, the, the price of oil had introduced created some, um, some real uncertainty in the lives of everyday uh, Venezuelans. Ironically, in this final period from 1996 to 1999, there was uh, quite a successful administration under a president called Rafael Caldera who had managed to tame hyperinflation, introduced some policies that had uh, begun to re redistribute wealth significantly to, uh, to the urban poor. Um, but this was at a time that another aspirant for political power was on the rise, one who adopted a very different playbook. His name was Hugo Chavez, and he came with a few things that were that endeared him to the Venezuelan people. The first is that he had a, a narrative, uh, an explanation for the ills in Venezuelan society, where he pointed to a profound and enduring permanent division between uh, the rich and the poor, and argued that it was the fault of certain Venezuelans against other Venezuelans. He also had a tremendous talent for communications, uh, he had launched uh, a pair of very um, dramatic coup d'etats in 1992, which had killed a total of about 100 people. Between the two of them, relatively small in uh, the scale of bloodshed of other coup d'etats in Latin America, uh, but it also pr produced a tremendous um, uh, impression in the public mindset of someone who was willing to go to extraordinary lengths to try and break some of the problems that had beset Venezuela. Uh, he was also able to leverage a very rich current of anti-American sentiment, which runs very deep in, uh, in Latin America uh, for very good reasons, building on quite a, a long history of American intervention uh, in the region. Uh, but he wove that uh, narrative about the, div the fundamental division in their, s in their society between rich and poor in with uh, fierce critique of uh, American foreign policy as being in, uh, in active collaboration with the rich of the country uh, to deprive the, the poor of their, of their just due. He also claimed that the institutions of representative democracy were not part of the solution but part of the problem and needed uh, radical overhaul. Chavez was elected in 1998, late 1998. He was up against a beauty queen. Uh, in retrospect, probably not the best contender for a political office that the uh, more traditional parties could have put forward. Um, he won handily, and he was good to his word. He introduced uh, a total change in the Constitution uh, shortly after he came to power. Um, at this point, Venezuelans were so exhausted from 20 years of economic stability that in the initial years there was quite a wide degree of uh, uh, willingness to, to see where Chav Chavez would, uh, would take things. And the new constitution, the one that he introduced in 1999, incidentally is the one that's uh, become so controversial recently for some of the provisions that it, that it uh, has in its uh, article 333, which allows the National Assembly uh, to fill a void in the, in the presidency with, by appointing the president of the National Assembly, the president of the country. Ironically, the Guaido uh, forces are invoking the Chavista Constitution as they're arguing for a restoration of the rule of law. Chavez was blessed with uh, the pendulum swinging once again. So if the pendulum had swung towards a severe drop in the price of oil in 1982, it came back roaring uh, shortly after he was elected and stayed high for the entire time that he was 
uh, president. It averaged at above $100 uh, per barrel for many of the years that he was in, uh, he was in office. And it was a heady time for Venezuela. There were some significant strides made in the redistribution of wealth. There was some very innovative social policies that attempted to redistribute the population and some things that had never been thought of before. For example, Venezuela. Venezuela is um, the first, or Caracas is the first city in the world that uses a, a gondola to transport um, commuters um, from these shanty towns. One of the innovative policies the Chavez government came was let's just lift them up above the traffic and carry them to downtown. So if you're in, in Caracas, you'll see these like skiing gondolas going over. It was a, it was a government that was uh, really quite creative in some of the solutions that it came with and had this tremendous uh, resources, something like $700 billion uh, of uh, surplus oil revenue that was earned in this time. I arrived in Venezuela at the tail end of this. Chavez had just recently died uh, in March of 2013, and I arrived in March of 2014, so exactly a year into the mandate of the new president, Nicolas Maduro. And I saw some of the positive impacts and the negative impacts of the Chavista period in, uh, in power. There was still the urban poor, and uh, there were still some uh, significant levels of poverty among the, uh, among the urban population. Um, there was uh, some greater inclusion that, they, uh, that these populations had earned in the political system, uh, and yet there was also a deep, deep division in the country. There were it was, it was as if Venezuelans had two radically different stories about what their country was, what the problems were, and what the solutions would be. It often felt as if um, these two sets of Venezuelans hadn't talked to each other in many, many years. Uh, unfortunately for Venezuela, the pendulum swung again in 2014. So shortly after I was there, uh, the price of oil dropped dramatically once again. Now, it only dropped to from $100 to $45 the second time, not nearly as severe as the drop in the 1980s, and yet it was absolutely devastating for the Venezuelan economy. And this is where I'd like to introduce the discussion about populism, because the methods, the techniques that, you, that Chavez had introduced had uh, polarized the country to such an extent that the Maduro government proved unable and depending on your political perspective, unwilling to address the scale of the economic calamity that came when oil dropped in 2014. Let me go through those four aspects that I alluded to very quickly. And these are the four aspects, uh, the political methods of populism that we see in many countries around the world. The first was a narrative of division. The starting point for Chavez's analysis of Venezuela is that the country is profoundly and fundamentally divided. This is not a country that is uh, coming together around a common set of ideals. Rather, it's a country that's fundamentally and permanently divided between the rich and the poor. There, the second element is this obsession with communications. Um, which had created a, a strong bond between Chavez and uh, many of the individual voters in Venezuela. Uh, he was one of the first um, recent world leaders uh, to invest very heavily in communications, originally in television. Chavez was famous for being the television president. He would host an, a weekly television news program, or television program where he would host and he would receive guests Every single week, it was called Allo Presidente, and it would, uh, it would take three or four hours and it would be broadcast on every single TV screen across the country. This uh, at first seemed to be just a novel way of communicating with the population, uh, but it, over time it actually became the principal venue for significant decisions that the president would make. He would govern on television. Uh, he was a phenomenal entertainer, uh, and when you're actually seeing a president make decisions live, uh, sometimes life and death decisions, uh, it turned out to be pretty riveting television. Uh, it got to the point that many cabinet ministers wouldn't, secure, wouldn't be able to secure time with the president unless they showed up on the television. And so cabinet ministers would come with their briefings about 
what was happening with the hydroelectric uh, dam or um, issues related to the Aboriginal population in the south, or uh, the foreign minister would come in and talk about a dispute with the United States, and he would have his discussion with the president live and on TV. I suppose you might see it as an act of radical transparency. Once um, Chavez actually made preparations for war on his television program, and there'd been a spat with Colombia, he called his uh, minister of defense and chief of defense staff onto the show and gave them instructions live on TV to start preparing plans for an invasion of Colombian territory by air, sea, and land. It was riveting television. Um, and yet, there was a, uh, there was a concomitant and, um, reduction in the amount of policymaking that the government was doing off screen. Most of the actual work of the governing of the country was being conducted uh, on screen. And as a result, uh, Chavez was able to establish this direct contact with the population. Now, it's relatively uh, common for, for politicians to want to uh, establish that kind of direct discussion with, uh, with voters and to have a, a narrative that they, they attempt to, uh, to impose on others. What, was, what seemed unique about Chavez at the time, and we've since seen as quite common to populist leaders of all stripes, uh, is that he would consistently turn the attention to topics that were extremely divisive in Venezuelan politics. He would come back over and over again to hot-button issues, uh, knowing that they would further divide the population. One of them was the Caracaso, so I referred to that traumatic event that Venezuelans had, had experienced in 1989. There were a, a quite a lot of human rights abuses connected in that time, and there were NGOs that had compiled long lists of uh, arbitrary disappearances, of murder by, by police forces, of seizure of property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those NGOs, however, were frozen out of government and were uh, hounded by the, uh, by the government, while President Chavez would continually revisit the, uh, the horrors of 1989. Rather than trying to address them and introduce justice and help the society and move on, uh, in other words, what he attempted to do was to reopen the wound of the Caracaso over and over again. After mass protests in 2002 that uh, were ultimately taken over by um, uh, coup plotters uh, associated with the Chamber of Commerce, there was a two-day period in which there were pitched battles, military battles, which Chavez uh, ultimately won and returned uh, to power. So another extremely divisive event in Venezuelan uh, politics. During that um, two days of, uh, of battle, urban battle, as the, the Chavista forces were attempting to regain power, there was famous footage of a shooting incident on a bridge uh, over a very busy intersection in downtown Caracas, which resulted in the death of 11 people. The video footage is extremely ambiguous, and both sides claim that the 11 victims uh, were on their side and were shot by the other side. Um, there, these cases were never brought uh, to justice, rather they fed into the president's weekly television programs for the subsequent years, reliving the trauma of that movement over and over again. Populists have a tendency, in other words, to burn the middle ground. There is a, a point to the communications, the heavy emphasis on communications, which is to establish an emotional bond between the part of the population that the populists appeal to with the charismatic leader, and part and parcel of that is also to create an emotional reaction between the part of the population that is being demonized by the charismatic leader. Either emotional reactions serve the interests of the, uh, of the leader because it places the charismatic leader at the center of attention in the country. Whether you love him or you hate him, you're talking about him, and he is setting the agenda. The third element was the, uh, the tendency to blame outside forces. In the case of Chavez uh, and his successor Maduro, there's a uh, frequent invocation of, uh, of the ills of the, uh, of the United States. Um, when I was there, it was in the period of time that Barack Obama was president, and there was 
not really a week or two weeks that would go by without some fresh news of a coup that had been plotted by the U.S. Embassy. 